I'm going to request you to please rise from your seats and please have a look at Matthew 5 and verses 10 to 12 at this time. At the count of three, let's all read together aloud. One, two, read. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless you for this blessed time you've given us, O God. Once again, to worship you, you deserve the highest praise. And we thank you, Lord, that we could study your word again. And this is a wonderful experience, Lord, to gather around your word, that we might be conformed to the image of your Son. We pray, O God, that we will not be resistant to the word of God, but that we might receive everything that you have to say to us through your word. We pray, O God, for open eyes, open hearts, and open minds. I pray for myself, O God, that you might give me the equipping and the empowering to be able to share and impart your truth to your people with truth, clarity, and passion. I pray, O God, that your name be glorified in our midst as we give you praise and thanks. In Jesus' blessed name we pray, amen and amen. Let's be seated in the presence of the Lord. I've entitled this morning's sermon, Happily Harassed. Now, you and I know that we meet certain roadblocks in our Christian lives as we go through our own Christian journey. And we know that these roadblocks somehow slow us down, maybe cause us to actually stop even or maybe turn our back at least for a while from our pursuit of godliness and God himself. Now, one of those serious roadblocks that we meet is persecution. However, I'd like to be able to say that persecution in itself is actually a blessing because it clearly is an evidence that you and I are truly sons and daughters of God. For as the Bible says, the godly shall be persecuted. And so our response towards persecution should not be a shrinking back, but rather we are to rejoice that we have been given the opportunity to be able to suffer for the name of Christ. Now the word persecution comes from the Greek word dioko, which means driving or chasing away a withstanding or keeping one from his goal. So if we were to summarize all the things that we find in this Greek word, probably we can summarize it in one word. And that word would be harassment or being harassed. Now our response, again, should be that of rejoicing because remember this, we are never victims. We are always victors. The Bible says that we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loved us. Now, there are two things I see in this passage. I'd like to be able to present to you a little outline with certain sub-points just to make everything clear to us. So, the first major point that we will be discussing is the blessedness of persecution for the sake of righteousness. The blessedness of persecution. Again, it sounds like a contradiction of terms. This is the reason why I have entitled it Happily Harassed. Because even as we are being harassed by the world, there is really rejoicing in our hearts. And by the way, this is not something that is theoretical. All you need to do is go to the book of Acts and what do you see? You see a lot of rejoicing. You see a lot of gladness in spite of the fact that they were persecuted. Now, we have certain subpoints under that major heading. We're going to talk about the persecution because of righteousness, but we also have to define what righteousness is all about because the world has varying definitions about what righteousness is. Now, we're going to talk about the result of righteousness, which I mentioned to you is persecution. 
And then, we're going to talk about the wrong reasons for persecution because it is possible to be persecuted for the wrong reasons. Now, you don't want to be in that place because that is not godliness. That is, in fact, unrighteousness. And what comes about is your being able to destroy the testimony of Christ or the testimony of the Word of God. You don't want to be the very impediment to the gospel. So we're going to talk about that. And then under that uh, second sub-point would be the reward, which is the millennial kingdom. And sadly, when I talk about the millennial kingdom, I find that some people are open wide, open-eyed and open-mouthed. Uh, they, they have open mouths when I begin to explain about the millennial kingdom, and it's like something that they've never heard of. However, we find an abundance of teaching about the millennial kingdom, both in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, more so in the Old Testament, as we take a look at the major and the minor prophets. But the fact that a lot of Christians don't know about the millennial kingdom speaks about the fact that many Christians don't actually dig deep into the Word of God. Because if we dig deep into the Word of God, we realize that God actually has a plan for earth. Now, definitely, earth will be destroyed, not by a flood, but it will be destroyed by fire, according to what the book of Peter tells us. But the Bible also says that there will be new heavens and a new earth. And this is where we will find the millennial kingdom. Now, we're going to talk about that more in the days to come. But then again, very important that we realize that we're not just creatures. We will not just be creatures of heaven, but we will continue to be creatures of earth as kings and rulers in God's kingdom. Now, the second major point of our study is the blessedness of persecution for Christ's sake. And under that, we have three sub-points. First, we're going to talk about the three expressions of hatred towards Christianity, and that would be insult, persecution, and false accusations. Those are things that we would experience if we are genuinely born again. Now, what should be our responses to this persecution? Well, two synonymous words, we are to rejoice and we are to be glad. Now, what is the rationale for our response? Well, because we're going to have a great reward in heaven. And not only that, we belong to a great company of believers, both in the Old and in the New Testament. And so let's dive into our passage once again, and let's have a look at the blessedness of persecution for the sake of righteousness. Allow me to read verse 10 at this time, which says, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of of righteousness. Now, again, this tells us that there is persecution because of righteousness. But first, let's define what righteousness is all about. The root meaning of righteous from the Greek word is to divide and to be different. I like the preaching of uh, Dr. Steve Lawson in our Sunday afternoon service. I just wonder how many of you were able to attend the Sunday afternoon service last uh, Sunday. Could you raise your hands? Well, quite a bit, all right? So we thank the Lord for that, and He defined for us what holiness is all about. I'd like you to understand that the word holiness as He described it and the word righteousness as we will define it actually has very similar meanings. Because as I mentioned to you, holiness, as he defined it, meant to divide. And again, when we take a look at the word righteousness here, it also means to divide. I like the illustration that he used. He used a piece of paper, if you recall, some of you who are here. And he used the paper, he used one whole piece of paper, and he said, the meaning of holiness, and I would say this time, the meaning of righteousness is to divide. That is what it is all about. So on one hand, here is righteousness, and on another hand, here we find wickedness. 
On one hand, we find those who are sons and daughters of God. And on the other hand, here we find those who are sons and daughters of the world. There is a huge divide between the two. And that is why you can easily distinguish both. You know those who are truly sons and daughters of God, and it is also easy to identify those who belong to the world. How do we find that? Well, we know that if you are a believer in Christ, if you are believers in Christ, we think differently. Number two, we react differently. Number three, we speak differently. There is a world of difference between the sons of light and the sons of darkness. In fact, the Bible says that darkness hates light. Now, what does light speak of? Now, we're not talking about literal light here, but the word light in the Bible somehow represents truth and the practice of truth, which is righteousness and holiness. And that is something that should be found in us believers. Now, for practical purposes, how do we see righteousness being played out in our lives? Well, we have already studied the seven Beatitudes. And the seven Beatitudes actually tell us what righteousness is all about. It makes it graphic to us. It makes it clear and plain to us. So let's just review some of the Beatitudes that we have studied so far, and once again, this is a display of what righteousness is all about. First of all, the Bible says, blessed are those who are poor in what? In spirit. Now, what does that mean? Now, that's not talking about material poverty. That's talking about spiritual poverty. It's talking about a person who is completely dependent on God. And the reason why he is completely dependent on God is because he understands that he is spiritually bankrupt. He has nothing to offer to God. He has zero merit before God. And because of this, he relies on God completely, most especially in relation to his own salvation. Now, number two, we said that aside from Blessed are the poor in spirit. It says, blessed are those who mourn. Now, we're not talking about a funeral parlor experience here. The mourning here is connected to the first beatitude. And the mourning here has to do with the fact that as we see our spiritual bankruptcy, as we see that we are sinful, as we see that we are undeserving, we mourn because of the sins that we commit against God. We realize that we have offended the holiness of God. We realize that we have transgressed the laws of God. And the result of that is a mourning, a grieving, a weeping because of the sins that we have committed. Now, that also segues into another beatitude. The Bible says, blessed are those who are meek. Now, what is meekness? Just to define it simply to you, it speaks about power under control. You might have the power to maim, destroy, endure, kill somebody. But because the Spirit of God lives and dwells in you, what you desire is peace. What you desire is reconciliation. Therefore, you have self-control. You do not seek to destroy others, endure others, but to help others. Now, that is what meekness is all about. Now, the Bible also says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What does this speak of? This speaks about a spiritual appetite. If you are a true born-again Christian, you will definitely have an appetite for spiritual things. You will hunger and thirst for truth. You will hunger and thirst for the Word of God. You will hunger and thirst to commune with God. You decide to be in the very presence of the Lord, for at His presence, in His presence is fullness of joy. At His right hand are pleasures forevermore. And this is a hunger and thirst that is a continuing thing. 
It's not a one-shot deal. You're constantly hungry and thirsty for God. And this is where you see what, what I would like to call a holy discontent. You never ever feel that you have arrived spiritually in your life. You're constantly striving to grow in the things of God's kingdom. And then the Bible also says, blessed are those who are merciful. A person who is truly born of God has great compassion. He's not like the Pharisee who was looking down on the tax gatherer and saying, I thank thee, O God, I'm not like this tax gatherer. A person who has mercy has compassion. He sees a need. He sees the sad plight, the miserable plight of certain people. And he would want to be a part of the solution to the problem. He's not simply somebody who says, Luoi kaayo, uh, when he sees a person in misery, but he takes action. He is somebody who takes action. action. It is compassion in action. And then the Bible says, blessed are the pure in heart. You know, it's easy to fake certain things. You can fake spirituality. You can fake humility. You can fake love, but one thing you cannot fake, you cannot fake what is truly inside your heart. And God being an omniscient God sees everything that is in our heart. He reads us very clearly. He knows us inside and out. And so if there's going to be any radical change in our lives, it has to begin with the heart. That is why the Bible says, Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart. And then right after that, he also speaks about being peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. A believer in Christ is never a troublemaker. A, a believer in Christ never seeks to divide never seeks to create division, most especially when it comes to the body of Christ. Remember, the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ is that His disciples become one. And so the desire of somebody who is a true child of God is to bring about restoration and reconciliation among brothers and sisters. He is somebody who will not sow intrigue. He is not somebody who will be engaged in gossip. He's not somebody who will be engaged in slander, but rather he is somebody who seeks to raise up people from where they are. His motive and his intention is always restoration and reconciliation. And that's why even in the practice of church discipline, we need to understand that's not being a harsh, but actually it's speaking about tough love. The point really of church discipline is not to destroy a person, but rather to lift up that person, to open the person's eyes that he might see where he is wrong. And when he sees where he is wrong, he is restored back into his fellowship with the Lord and restored back in his fellowship with other people. So again, the first seven Beatitudes actually speak about what righteousness is all about. And so, again, we need to be able to ask ourselves the question, do we have that in our hearts? Are we poor in spirit? Are we people who are meek? Are we, are we our people who mourn, who are daily repenters of sin? Do, do we have purity of heart? Are we people who seek peace with others? These are questions we need to be able to answer. Because you know what, brothers and sisters, it's not about listening to the Word of God. It's about obeying the Word of God that makes us blessed. You know, you can come here and study the Word of God together with your pastor, and you can nod, and you can say your amens, and say your hallelujahs, and sing your songs. But you know, in the end, what really matters to God is that you apply the Word of God in your life so that what the Bible wants you to be, which is a righteous person, is exactly what should be happening in your life, in your marriage, in your raising up of your children, in your everyday living. This is what needs to happen. 
Now, let me tell you what the result of righteousness is. It is persecution. It is no coincidence that right after Jesus talks about peacemaking, he then talks about persecution. Now, why do you think that is a necessary segue? Because, let me just tell you this, godliness generates hostility. Could you say this with me? Godliness, say it louder, please. Godliness generates hostility. Once again. Louder, please. Godliness generates hostility. It's impossible that if you were a believer who was walking uprightly in the ways of God, that you would not be persecuted. Now, I'm not saying that some of us will be beheaded. I'm not saying that some of us will be martyred. I'm not saying that some of us will be imprisoned. I'm not saying that some of us, our properties will be seized. Now, this happens in other parts of the world where there is a Christian testimony and a Christian influence. But you see, persecution does not come always in those extreme forms. But most definitely, if you are a Christian, a genuine Christian at that, you will experience some form of suffering and you will experience some form of persecution for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ. The Bible is very clear that darkness hates light. And Jesus Christ said, no servant is greater than his master. If the master was persecuted, so shall we be persecuted. If the master suffered, so shall we suffer as well. If the master was called Belzebul or a devil, we too would also be called in those ways. So once again, this is the reality of the Christian life. What happened when the world saw a perfect man? When the world saw a perfect man, they crucified him. That is what they did. And what did Jesus do? He only did good to people. He healed the sick. He raised up uh, dead people back to life. He cleansed those who were lepers. He gave, he gave sight to those who were blind. He gave hearing to those who were deaf. He made the lame walk. He preached the Word of God. He preached the truth. He loved people. He reached out to them. And yet, this perfect man was crucified by the world. That is exactly what happens when godliness is exposed to darkness. There is going to be a hostility. There is going to be a collision. Why does godliness generate hostility, you might ask? Because righteousness is confrontational even when it is not preached. Let me say it once again. Because righteousness is confrontational even when it is not preached. You know what righteousness does? It challenges the world system. It challenges the beliefs of people. It challenges the culture of people. It challenges the philosophy of the world. That is what righteousness does even without saying one word. Just to give you some examples, when we don't bribe, what are we telling people? When we don't bribe, we are telling people that you are corrupt to, ex to expect bribery from me or to expect, expect a bribe from me. You are being dishonest. You are not a person of integrity. So when I refuse to give a bribe to somebody who is asking me to do so, again, it is an indictment on what he is doing. When your classmate, for example, asks you to, to copy your answers and you hide your answers, not because you're being selfish, but because it's all about honesty, it's all about integrity. When you do that, what is in fact, what, what is it that you are in fact saying to people who are trying to copy from you? You're saying to them, you are dishonest. What else are you saying? You're saying that you're lazy. You're not studying. 
And because you're not studying, you want the easy way out right now. You want to be able to get good grades without studying, without educating yourself. That is, in fact, what you are really trying to say to this person. And people will hate you for that because people always want the shortcut. Let me tell you, in the Christian life, there is no such thing as a shortcut, but only a sure cut. And the shortcut comes from the Word of God, the Bible itself. That is how you and I live our lives. And as we live our lives uh, for the glory of God, it is an indictment towards others. By our words and our deeds, we are saying to people, you are wrong. You are ungodly. You are evil. You are dishonest. You are perverse. When you and I do not laugh, at the green jokes of people, what are we saying? You're saying to people, you have a dirty mind. You have a dirty mouth. You are malicious. You're always thinking about lustful things. That is, in fact, what you are saying. That is why righteousness will always generate hostility. See, just using once again this piece of paper as an illustration, here is righteousness and here is ungodliness. And they're walking in opposite directions. Righteousness is walking this way towards godliness, but you see, those who are ungodly are walking towards wickedness and towards ungodliness. And when these two forces are walking opposite to each other, guess what's going to happen? There's going to be a collision. There's going to be a collision. It cannot be helped. It will happen. There is going to be a collision. It is impossible not to collide. When you go to the book of Genesis, for example, what do you discover? The very first instance where there was a collision between godliness and ungodliness in the person of two brothers, Abel and Cain. Abel was a righteous person. Now, when we take a look at the story in the book of Genesis, we need to be able to understand that God must have made his requirements clear to both Abel and Cain. Otherwise, God should have no expectations whatsoever. So we assume rather safely that God made his requirements clear to both Abel and Cain. Sadly, the Bible says that God rejected not only Cain, but his offering. God rejected the offerer as well as the offering. In the case of righteous Abel, his offering was accepted by the Lord. His person and his offering was accepted by the Lord. What was the result? Now remember, Abel did not do anything to offend his brother. Abel must have loved his brother Cain. Didn't say anything. He did not say to, to Cain, ha, Look at, look at you. You have such a, a, an inferior offering. And, and look at my offering. My offering is superior. Well, Abel never said that. He never lifted or exalted himself above his own brother. And yet, what was the result? The result was envy. The result was anger. The result was competition. And guess what happens in the end? Cain murders Abel. Now, that might be an extreme situation, but friends, that is exactly what happens when righteousness and ungodliness collide. There's bound to be a collision. There's bound to be a friction. There's bound to be a provocation, not from our side, but the world will be provoked by our own righteousness. The contrast, of course, is this. When there is no righteousness, there is no persecution. Say this with me. No righteousness means no persecution. Say it louder, please. No righteousness. Let's do this all at the same time. No righteousness means no persecution. Let's say it once again. No righteousness means no persecution. 
I have a question for you. Have you been persecuted? Have you experienced suffering for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ? Have people belittled you, harassed you, become impolite to you, not given you the proper courtesy because of your faith? Has it ever happened to you, brothers and sisters? Because if you've never, ever been persecuted for your faith, if you've never, ever been persecuted for standing for what is right, then may I submit to you, maybe you don't have a relationship with Christ. Maybe you do not have a genuine relationship with Christ because if you are living a righteous life, if you are living a godly life, if you are living a life of uprightness, if you are a man of honesty and a man of integrity, if you are a man who could not be bribed, if you are a man who could not be corrupted, if you are a man who walks according to the ways of God, the world will definitely hate you for who you are because the way you behave is an indictment to them. You know why they hate you? Because they always think that what they are doing is what every Tom, Dick, and Harry is doing after all. If I'm wicked, everybody else is wicked. If I'm perverse, everybody else is perverse. If I am dishonest, well, everybody is dishonest. If I am corrupt, everybody else is corrupt. That's the culture. That's the way people live in this life here on earth. That's how people live. And then you come into the picture. And you know what they're thinking? They're thinking that the righteousness that we're talking about, the righteousness that we're living is actually an impossible dream. To be meek, to be humble, to mourn, to be poor in spirit, to be merciful. They think that, that these things are impossible to live out consistently, steadfastly, and faithfully. But then you come along living your righteous life. You come along and your light is shining all over the place. And the darkness of people's lives are now exposed. And that causes them to hate you. Because previous to that, they were comfortable. Because they were thinking, I'm just like everybody else. And what they thought was impossible by living a godly life, you are saying, no friend, it is possible. It is possible to be righteous. It is possible to be faithful to God. It is possible to be spiritually hungry and thirsty for the things of God. It is possible to be upright. It is possible to die for your own principles. And the world hates that because they don't want to be removed from their own comfort zone. They want to remain on in their sins. They do not want their conscience to be pricked. They do not want to be convicted. They don't want you to be right. You know why? Because they don't want to accept Christ as Lord and Savior of their lives. They don't want to give up their vices. They don't want to give up their smoking. They don't want to give up their drinking. They don't want to give up their addictions. They don't want to give up their pornography. But your life is saying, you could do it. You could give up all these things. You could surrender your eyes. You could smash and bash and destroy all those idols in your heart. It could be done because the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So again, let's, let's put shoe leather to this. Are you persecuted? At least to some degree, are you persecuted? And this should 
set a, a process of thinking in our minds and hearts and a self-evaluation. Friends, it's, it's not about knowing a lot of doctrine. It's not about knowing a lot of Bible knowledge. The only blessedness that Jesus is talking about is a blessedness of obedience. Because knowledge, otherwise, if it's just knowledge, pops up. It's like a new kind of Gnosticism wherein you begin to feel superior because of what you know. You know what true biblical knowledge brings about? It brings about a poverty of spirit. It brings about humility. It brings about a bowing of your knee and your heart before God and asking God, Lord, help me. I am helpless. I am hopeless without you. I need you, Lord, in my life. That is what true knowledge brings about. Our persecution, brothers and sisters, by the way, must stem from the right reasons, and one of them should be because of righteousness. Let it not be that we enter into a new job or a new employment, and we spend a whole day, and then we reach home. Our wife, who is quite anxious how we did in our job, would ask us, well, how was your first day in office? And I hope you will not say, well, it was great. Nobody found out I was a Christian. I hope you will not, I hope people will not say that of you. I hope you will not say that to your wife. It was great. Nobody knew I was a Christian. Nobody knew. Is that what greatness is all about? Is that the greatness that God desires for us? Doesn't the Bible say that we should be partakers of the suffering of Christ? Doesn't the Bible say that the godly shall be persecuted? See, the problem with the 21st century church is that it's a church that finds itself in so many comfort zones. We want to be comfortable. We do not want to be inconvenienced. We do not want to be told that we are wrong and that we need to change. We do not want to be told that there is still a higher level of, of spiritual walk that God has destined for those who are truly, genuinely pursuing God. We do not want to be told that. When it comes to our obedience, many times our obedience is selective. We select the parts which we feel we can do, and we omit the parts we feel we cannot do. That's not the kind of Christianity that we find in the Bible. So if we're going to be persecuted, let's be persecuted for the right reasons, not for the wrong reasons. And let me just cite to you some of the wrong reasons we can be persecuted. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning at verse 14. It says, 1 Peter 4, 14, If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you, make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, listen well, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. There's no shame in suffering for the name of Christ. I've been called Mr. Hallelujah and Mr. Praise the Lord. I have been disrespected so many times because of my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'd like to be able to say, there is no shame to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. In fact, we should rejoice and exult in the fact that we could suffer for the sake of the name of Jesus. By the way, let's balance this. 
When the Bible says the godly shall be persecuted, we should not be people who are seeking to be persecuted. We shouldn't be saying, persecute me, please, persecute me. No, 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 no. You don't have to do that. If you're living a godly life, don't worry. You don't have to say that. People will, people will in fact, persecute you. And so let me share to you some wrong reasons why we could be persecuted. One could be evangelistic zeal without wisdom. Now, the Bible says that we are to be fishers of men, right? Say yes. yes. And so if we are to be fishers of men, we are how, to, how, how are we to conduct it? The Bible says, speak the truth in love. Say this with me. Speak the truth in love. One. Louder, please. Say it for the last time. Now, if we go to the New Testament, how did Peter and all the rest fish? They used baits and they used nets. Sadly, some people today, with their own evangelistic methods, use dynamite fishing. And what happens when you use dynamite to try catch fish? What do you think is going to happen? The fish will die. The Bible says, speak the truth in love. You know, sometimes we don't have wisdom. We have the passion, but we don't have the wisdom sometimes. I recall there was one person, and this is a true story, by the way. He attended an evangelistic seminar and so he became so on fire and so passionate. He learned certain methods of how to share the gospel. And so he wanted to exercise what he had learned in this evangelistic seminar. So he rode this jeepney and he intentionally sat beside the jeepney driver. And he said, I'm going to share to this jeepney driver. And so he asked this jeepney driver with a, with a question and he tried to modulate his voice. And he said, Sigurado ba ka? Nga mga ka sa langit? And the driver looked at him with a strange look and said, Sir, sorry, kutob lang mi sa kulon. <laughs> now that's funny. Alright? But some of the methods we employ are actually abrasive. Some of the methods that we employ are actually harsh and offensive. Remember this one thing. God called us to be witnesses, not prosecuting lawyers. Could I say that once again? God called us to be witnesses, not prosecuting lawyers. We make a terrible mistake when we speak the truth with much anger. We need to understand the Bible says there's only one way, speak the truth in love. And by the way, this is the reason why, again, let me push conversational evangelism. I hope that you will be convicted with the fact, and if this is true, that you have not been sharing the gospel to anybody. How can you keep this wonderful treasure which will radically change the lives of so many people? How can you keep this treasure that can cause people's names to be written in the book of life? How can you withhold information that could actually make a person a better husband or a better wife? or a better child? How can you possibly withhold information that can actually change our neighborhood, our community, our city, and even our entire nation? You see, the reason sometimes we complain about what's happening to our country, but my big question is, are we doing our part? The Bible says we are salt and light. And what is the purpose of salt and light? 
The purpose of salt and light is to permeate society. And as we permeate society, we change the society that we are living in. What did Paul say in Romans chapter 1? I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation, both to the Jew and to the Greek. Why is it that many believers are ashamed of the gospel? Why is it that many believers have shut their mouth and have not spoken the word of God to their friends and to their relatives and to their office mates and to their classmates? Why have we chosen to be silent? Don't we know that people are dying every single day? Thousands upon thousands of people every single day are dying. And they are dying with a Christless eternity. I feel deeply burdened, deeply saddened, greatly frustrated that very few believers actually are intentional in sharing the gospel. Now, as we talk about evangelism, some people think, well, it's, it's a matter of techniques. No, it's not, not a matter of techniques, but it's a matter of dependence on the Holy Spirit. This is the reason why if you depend on the Holy Spirit, you might say, well, you know, I've, I've not been trained. Well, well, the Holy Spirit will guide you. The Holy Spirit will empower you. The Holy Spirit will equip you. Notice how the Lord Jesus Christ, as He was led by the Spirit, began to evangelize not with a set technique or a set method. For example, to Nicodemus, he was a theologian. To the Samaritan woman, he was a prophet. And to the adulterous woman who was about to be stoned, he spoke as a father. So he spoke as a theologian, a prophet, and as a father. There are different ways to approach people. And you know, only the Holy Spirit knows what's inside the hearts of people. And that is why you will be spot on when you share the Word of God, when you are relying and allowing yourself to be led by the Spirit of God. Let's talk, let's talk about another reason why we could be persecuted for the wrong reasons. One would be an inconsistent lifestyle. I recall one pastor of a mega church. And when you say mega, really mega. Maybe numbering to 30,000. And one time this, this senior pastor of this mega church wanted a, a spot in a TV station. His deacon accompanied him. And you know how it is so difficult to, to earn a spot in, you know, in the regular stations. Interestingly, the senior pastor was trying to bribe the station manager just so he could get a spot. The deacon could not believe his ears. And the deacon said, isn't this wrong, pastor? And the pastor said, don't talk to me about spirituality. Just talk to me about practicality. Don't talk to me about spirituality. Just talk to me about practicality. Those are the kinds of things we should not be persecuted of. An inconsistent lifestyle. I recall Dr. Harold Sela, when we visited him in his headquarters in the United States, in Mission Viejo, California, he, he drove us to this fine Chinese restaurant, and, and then he also drove us into the, the beach. I just forgot what, what that beach was, wherein you have this yachts. But along the way, he pointed out to me that is where Benny Hinn lives. And I saw a very elaborate gate, 
a very huge property. I, I could not even see the house from where we were driving through because the house must have been so far away, which basically just tells you how massive the property must have been. We're not supposed to be persecuted because of our inconsistent lifestyle. And sadly, this is the reason why many people refuse to listen to many Christians. Because we've lost the power of our testimony. When we were still doing our midweek service in Magellan Hotel, some of you maybe are not familiar with Magellan Hotel. It got burned down. But that was where we started. And we were having our midweek fellowship. My wife and I just came out of our midweek Bible study. And I saw one of my classmates in high school from San Beda. And he was having his honeymoon with his wife. And so he asked me, Mel, so what are you doing? What are you doing right now? And of course, I would not lie. I said, I'm a pastor. I'm teaching the Bible. And he said something, well, that's good. But then he said something which saddened me. He said, and he said this in Tagalog. He said, okay naman ang Bible. Kaya lang, maraming pa-Bible-Bible Bible, wala namang pagbabago sa buhay nila. Many people talk about the Bible, but they don't allow the Bible to change their lives. One neighbor of ours, when I was still in Manila, said to me, Pag naging Christian, bumabagsak sa skwela. A person who becomes a Christian drops out of school. And what kind of testimony is that? We are not to be persecuted for the wrong reasons. Another reason why we get persecuted is excessive activism and skewed priorities. I recall one lady I met in a Bible study. It was a Bible study for women. And she said that she left her child with, with a very high fever and because, because she did not want to miss the Bible study. I think I actually met her for the first time and I wanted to be polite. If I knew her, I would have told her, you know what, that, that's wrong. Because you are the extension of God's love. And what, what will your daughter think that you have prioritized the Bible study and she's running a high fever? What if there's an emergency situation? The Bible study will always be there. But in an emergency situation like that, you take care of your child. So again, we get persecuted for the wrong reasons. Another reason why the church gets persecuted is because of its political involvement. Now, hear me out. I have no problems with Christians engaging in politics. If you're an individual Christian and you want to engage in politics, if that's God's will for you, go ahead and may God bless you. In fact, just very recently, I met with Senator Pia Cayetano and we had a wonderful time together with my wife. We talked to her for a number of hours, maybe two or three hours, and we got to know her a lot better. And she said, I'm here in Cebu because I'm bringing, I'm bringing an iPad to a child who has no arms but could draw with his feet. And I made the promise to this child or to this boy that I would come back to Cebu and I would give him an iPad so he could do his drawing on an iPad. I also learned that she had adopted a son. And when she adopted this son, she told her children, you understand, of course, that this adopted child is going to receive the same inheritance 
that you're going to have because I'm going to treat this child as my own. And the two daughters of Pia Cayetano said, of course, he is your son. And so I'm thankful to God for, for senators like that. She said, when I come to Cebu, can, can we do Bible study? She even asked if it's possible for her to join one of the tours that we do for Israel. She's, she's, a, she's very much on fire for God, and she, she's very, she was very open. She says, you know what? I even have disagreements with, with my own brother and so on. But pray for my brother, she said. Pray for me, she said. And again, we, we thank God for that. But again, let me just point this out. When it comes to the church, when it comes to the corporate body, when it talks about the community of believers, not the individuals, the church should be apolitical. It should not be political. It should be apolitical. Food for thought. Jesus lived in one of the most oppressive governments or empires of that time. I'm talking about the Roman Empire. But Jesus knew what his mission was. His mission was not to change the political landscape. His mission was to save the world. That is why you will not hear anything from Christ speaking against the oppressive Roman Empire and the government officials who were so corrupt during his time. Now, here's another reason why we could be persecuted, impure motives. When my father had a stroke, in the United States, I, I flew to the United States because I wanted to bring my father back home. And so I stayed with my aunt and I saw it as an opportunity to share the gospel to her and I began to share the word of God. I began to share the gospel to her. But then she cuts me off. And she says, the preachers that I know they own big mansions, they own yachts, and they own private planes. And I knew I could not argue with what she was saying because that, in fact, was true. So I did the next best thing, which was to keep silent because she presented an argument to me which has destroyed the Christian testimony. This is the reason why many of the millennials have become agnostics. This is the reason why many millennials have become atheists. Because we believers in Christ have not portrayed a good testimony to the world. We have not been Christ-like. We have not shown ourselves as pure. And because of that, the world has shut its ears and they refuse to listen to anything that we have to say. But it's not too late, brothers and sisters. What the world is looking for is genuineness. Are you a genuine person? Are you a genuine Christian? If we're going to be persecuted for righteousness' sake, let us be persecuted because we're genuine. So what is the reward? Well, the reward is the millennial kingdom. As I mentioned to you at the beginning, this world that we are living in, it, it's not going to be destroyed by a flood. If you see a rainbow in the sky, remember this, it's a covenant that God made with this world. A covenant that He would no longer destroy this world with a flood. But, He will destroy this world, this earth, with fire. This is the reason why the Bible says there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. And here's the promise of the Bible. The promise of the Bible is that if you and I are persecuted, the kingdom of heaven, the millennial 
kingdom belongs to us and you and I and all of us will one day rule this world. We will be kings as the Bible promises because our Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen? What a beautiful inheritance God has laid out for His people. We are totally undeserving of this grace. We are totally undeserving of this future grace that has been laid out for His people. But then again, God has chosen us to become sons and daughters of God. And we rejoice and exult in the fact that though this, this body that we have is decaying, though one day we will have to say goodbye to this world, our bodies will one day be resurrected once again. Christ will come again and He will come again together with His saints and we will rule and reign together with Christ. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the living God. Amen. Blessed be the name of Jesus Christ. There is no other name by which you and I could be saved except the name of Jesus Christ. Therefore, let the name of Christ be exalted forevermore. Knowing that we have such a bright and excellent and magnificent and majestic future should affect the way we behave. On March 11, 1830, a British girl was having her lessons with her British uh, tutor. And she learned through a genealogical chart that she was next in line for the throne. This little girl, when she learned this astounding fact that she was next on the throne, was so overwhelmed with such great emotion, she started to weep and cry. And later on, she wiped her tears. And she said to her tutor, I will be good. I will be good. This young girl later on became Queen Victoria. As we look at Scripture and look at what has been in store for us, shouldn't we say the same thing as this girl? I will be good. And if I am persecuted, so be it. I rejoice and exult in the name of Christ. Amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand, please. Can we bow our heads and close our eyes at this time? The Word of God is so convicting. It's a mirror. It's a mirror by which we are able to see who we really are. And the Beatitudes tells us that unless we have a relationship with Christ, we cannot live out the Beatitudes. It is simply impossible. And if in your heart you say, well, I want to be a child of God. I want to be able to live out this kind of a life if it is possible. And so you ask me, well, how can it be done? The only way it could be done is to have a personal relationship with Christ. The only way it could be done is for your soul to be saved. And salvation is not your work. It is not synergistic. It is not you and God. It is not you alone. Salvation is completely and absolutely the work 
of God. It is a monergistic work. Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty of your sins. And what you need to do is to accept by faith that that sacrifice is sufficient and complete to forgive you of all your sins, past, present, and future. But faith has a Siamese twin. And the Siamese twin of faith is repentance. If you're really turning to God, you should be turning away from sin. But turning away from sin is not by your own power. It is by the power of the Holy Spirit. And what you need to do, if you really want to have a relationship with Christ, what you need to do is come to Him and say, Lord, I receive your sacrifice. I repent of my sins. And I make you the Lord and Savior of my life. If you pray that sincerely from the bottom of your heart, you will be born again. You will be saved. Your name will be written in the book of life. Now remember this. It's not the prayer. It's not the raising of the hands that will save you. It's the faith and the repentance. Something that only God can see in your heart. But I know that some of us are thinking, how do I express that? And I'm here to guide you. So I'm just guiding you. I'm not manipulating you. I'm just guiding you if this is really what you want. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you want to accept Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, could you please slip up your right hand. You want to pray a prayer of surrender to Christ, just slip up your right hand. Yes, sister. Amen. Yes, sister. Amen. Yes, sister. Yes, sister. Amen. Yes, sister. I'm just seeing women. Yes, another sister. Amen. Any men in the house who want to give their lives to Christ? Another sister. Amen. Yes, another sister. I see some men right now raising their hands. Amen. Amen for that. All right, you can put them down right now. Again, let me just remind you, it's not the prayer. It's not your raising of hands. It's what's in your heart. So make sure that there is genuine faith and genuine repentance. Let us pray. Follow after me. Lord Jesus Christ. I ask for forgiveness for all my sins. Cleanse and wash me from all unrighteousness. I accept the free gift of eternal life through the sacrifice of Christ. And I repent of all my sins. Make me the kind of person you want me to be by the power of your Holy Spirit. I give you my whole being, my spirit, my soul, my body. Do what you want with my life. And I receive the free gift of eternal life in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer today, and if you prayed that prayer some time before, sincerely, genuinely, then you can join us in the Lord's table. I always say this, the Lord's table is not for everybody. It is only for those who have a genuine relationship with Christ. If you're still a practicing homosexual, this is not for you. If you are still a drug addict, this is not for you. If you are still deeply entrenched in the vices, if you're into immorality, adultery, fornication, in other words, if, you, if this is the way you live your life, then, then you're not a Christian. This is only for those who have really made a serious It is only for those who have a serious relationship with the Lord. 
So I invite you to join us at the Lord's table. And I'd like to ask the worship team to prepare our hearts, please. And let's ask our communion service to kindly assist, assist us at this time. Let's close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless you for all your goodness and love. Thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you, Lord. We can't thank you enough, Lord, but we thank you. And Lord, we pray, Father, that you will make us walk in a manner worthy of the calling that you've given us. That we may not be content about simply being church saints. May we not be church saints, but may we be Christians. May we live out our lives for the glory of God. And may we live with one purpose. And that is to fulfill your will in every aspect of our lives. Thank you for today. Thank you also that we could give our tithes, our grace gifts, and our offerings. Lord, use them for the glory of your holy name. And whatever has been achieved today, we give you back the glory, the praises, and the thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.